Hello everyone. My name is Daniel Keisters and I would like to thank the organizers of Crypto 2021 for the opportunity to present our paper called Thinking Outside the Superbox. This is joint work with Nicola Bohr, Johan Dame and Shiel van Asch. To motivate our work, consider modes. Modes are cryptographic algorithms that take arbitrary length input and give arbitrary length output. Internally, they make use of a primitive, and the primitives that we have considered are cryptographic permutations. These can be thought of as block ciphers for which the key has been fixed. An example of an unkeyed primitive is the sponge construction that you see on this slide. So the sponge construction is proven secure if f is a randomly and uniformly chosen permutation. And this means secure against generic attacks. That is to say, attacks that do not make use of any primitive specific properties. An example of a keyed mode is the keyed duplex. And the keyed duplex has as well been proven secure against generic attacks if uh, the primitive that is being used, f, is a randomly and uniformly chosen permutation. So these two examples show that the design space traditionally is split into two. So on the one hand, you have people that design boats, built on top of ideal primitives. And on the other hand, you have people that try to design the primitives to behave like ideal, ideal ones. However, the latter cannot be formalized. So in practice, assurance has to come from crypt analytic evaluation of round reduced versions of F, possibly used within the mode. So this requirement of behaving like an ideal one is quite strict and often maybe a little bit too strict. And it leads to primitives that are over-engineered and quite resource heavy. So a recent trend has been to design modes that take primitive specific properties into account during the design. An example of such a primitive aware mode is the one that you see on this slide, namely Farfalle. So clearly, um, design and crypt analysis are really intertwined. And this leads to the research question that you see on this slide, namely, how do the different designs of cryptographic permutations affect crypt analysis? So we've actually looked at both linear and differential, differential crypt analysis. However, for this talk, we will restrict to differential crypt analysis. So there are two things, design and crypt analysis. And we start by giving a short overview of differential crypt analysis, just to make sure that everyone agrees on the same uh, definitions. So given a permutation F, we call a tuple A, B, where A is an input difference that propagates to an output difference B through F, a differential. And assigned to a differential is its differential probability, also called the DP. And this is defined as the number of X for which the equation F of X plus F of X plus A equals B holds relative to the total number of different X. And an X which satisfies this equation uniquely, def uniquely defines a pair X comma X plus A that is said to follow the differential. And because of the addition property of the logarithm, it is often more convenient to work with the minus log two of the DP. And this is called the weight of the differential A comma B. The primitives that we have considered all have a similar structure. Namely, they are the composition of, say, R round functions of the form a nonlinear layer, which is an S box layer that is the parallel application of the number of S boxes, followed by a linear layer that is the composition of a mixing layer M and the shuffle layer P. And note that this mixing layer M is allowed to be the identity. And in fact, one of the primitives that we have considered uses a mixing layer that is simply the identity. 
And the shuffle layer is just another word that we use uh, for what is normally called a bit permutation. And finally, uh, this is followed by a translation, which is the addition of a round constant to break up any symmetries in the round. So typically, the linear and the nonlinear layer are the same for each round, whereas the round constant is used, like I said, to break these symmetries. So note that we have not considered Pistol structures or round functions that are based on ARX. So that is to say, round functions that make use of additions, rotations, and XOR. So perhaps the following figure helps to, to illustrate uh, this composition. So here you clearly see that there is a first nonlinear layer consisting of the parallel application of a number of S-boxes. And then we have drawn these boxes for the three other layers, namely the mixing layer, the permutation layer, and the translation at the end. And we see that this uh, structure is repeated for the number of rounds that has been chosen. Given that the permutation is composed of a number of rounds, um, it's possible to give a more precise description of how the differences propagate through this permutation. So in fact, we, we can specify an intermediate uh, difference, so a difference for each intermediate state in F. And this leads to an R plus one tuple of differences, where this R is the number of rounds. And this is called a differential trail. But this is also known as a differential characteristic, depending on uh, which paper you read. And similar to the differential case, uh, a DP or differential probability is assigned to a differential trail. So this is simply the number of input pairs that follow each difference of the trail relative to the total number of different pairs. And again, we define a weight of the differential trail, which is simply the sum of the weights of the round differentials. But this turns out to be equal to the weights of the uh, differentials over the active S-boxes. So this is by definition the case. So each trail actually partitions the, the set of pairs that follow the differential. And if this partition is non-trivial, so if there are multiple trails that share a uh, share the same input difference and the same output difference, then we say that these trails cluster within a differential. So the ciphers that we have considered, they differ in uh, one notion that we call alignment. Well, actually, the notion of alignment was coined by the Ketchuk designers in a paper that was presented during the ECRIT2 hash workshop of 2011 um, by means of how differences propagate through the round function. So this actually is a different definition than the one that we present in our paper. So intuitively, we can think of the bits being grouped along the S-box boundaries. So for example, bits are grouped in middles, so four bits if the S-box has size four, or in bytes, so eight bits if the S-box has size eight. And when the bits in the round function are consistently processed in these groups, then we say that the round function is aligned. And if each round function is aligned, we call the entire primitive aligned. So in the paper, you can find a more formal definition of what we mean by alignment. And from this definition, it immediately follows that there exists something called a superbox substructure. And combining this superbox substructure with a mixing layer that is the parallel application of an MBS matrix, you can reason about the differential properties of the cipher using combinatorial arguments. So in particular, this makes it possible to easily give bounds on the trail weights. And this was one of the I guess, selling points of AES, namely that it is resistant against differential cryptanalysis, where the argument was based on these trail bounds. However, of course, to be completely resistant against differential cryptanalysis, you need more than just trail bounds. So again, this is a figure that hopefully clarifies some of these things. So here you see, again, 
a layer of uh, S boxes. And compared to the previous figure, the mixing layer here is actually split into a number of sub functions, if you want to call them that, that are nicely aligned along the S box boundaries. And they are followed by a shuffle layer, so a bit permutation. And what you cannot see in this picture, because it was a bit difficult to draw, is that this, this shuffle layer actually shuffles the bits in groups. So I mean that if the bits belong to one group, then the group as a whole is moved to a different position. And then the shuffle layer is followed by a group-wise uh, addition of a constant. And then this structure is repeated for the, the other runs. So clearly, if there is an aligned approach, uh, it should not come as a surprise that there is also something that we call an unaligned approach. And in an unaligned approach, the idea is to avoid any such groupings when designing the round functions. So in general, although there are exceptions to this case, this means that you need computer programs to investigate the trail runs. So this naturally leads to the question, if it seems like there are only advantages to using the aligned approach. Why is not every cipher designed with an aligned approach? And in fact, many ciphers are indeed designed according to an aligned approach. But it turns out that an aligned approach may have some potentially unwanted side effects. And in the paper, we um, mentioned some of these side effects and we have generated a lot of data for four different primitives um, to actually quantify these side effects. And the four primitives that we have considered you can see in this table. Uh, actually in this table there are some block ciphers but these block ciphers have been transformed into a permutation by fixing the key to the constant zero. So the first primitive that we have considered is Rijndaal. And actually this is a somewhat modified version of Rijndaal in that its, its width is larger than what you would typically see, namely 256 bits. So according to our definition, Rijndaal is aligned. It has a strong mixing layer and its, its S-box works on bytes, so it has size 8. And there are 32 of such S-boxes corresponding to a width of 256 bits. So the second cipher that we have considered is Saturnet, which can be thought of as a more modern random. According to our definition, it is aligned. It has a strong mixing layer and it works on nibbles. So that means groups of four bits. There are 64 such S boxes corresponding to a width of 256 bits. So third, we have looked at Spongent which again, according to our definition, is aligned. It has a weak mixing layer because the mixing layer is simply the identity function. And it works on nibbles, so four bits. And there are 96 of such S-boxes, corresponding to a width of 384 bits. And finally, we have looked at permutation Zulu. And Zulu is an example of a permutation that follows the unaligned approach. It has a strong mixing layer and it has a rather small S-box size because it works on three on, on, on groups of three bits. And there are 128 of such S-boxes corresponding to a width of 384 bits. So clearly we have a sample space of only four ciphers. Um, but already this took quite a lot of work. So in order to increase the sample space, we would like you to also work on this. So please expand this, this, this sample space. And in order to help you with this, we have made uh, our software available at the following URL. So let's now compare an aligned approach uh, with the unaligned approach in a more quantitative way. So the differential probability of a drill can be approximated by the product of the GPs of the active S-boxes. So an S-box is active if the input difference to that S-box is non-zero. 
And actually, if equality holds, then we say that the round differentials are independent. So when does a trail have a low differential probability? Either if there are not many S-boxes active, or the S-boxes have a very high dp, or of course both. And the idea behind the white trail strategy is to ensure that all trails have many active S-boxes. So intuitively, you, you take your mixing layer and you look at its input and its output. And you want to make sure that in the tuple of both this input and output, there are many active S-boxes. So in particular, if there are very few active S-boxes in the input A, then you would like to make sure that there are many active S-boxes in the output M of A. And if there are a few active S-boxes in the output B, then you would like to make sure that there are many active S-boxes at the input, so M inverse of B. So a natural thought is to consider the whole distribution over all the non zero A's of the box weight of A plus the box weight of M of A, where the box weight is simply the measure that counts the number of active S boxes. And the minimum is called the branch number. And this gives a way of kind of um, lower bounding the number of S boxes that are always present in the round function. But the branch number can actually be seen as the minimum of well this distribution, so actually of something that you could present in a histogram. And here you see two such histograms. So on the one hand you have the bitweight histogram, and on the other hand you have the box weight histogram. So the bitweight histogram shows the number of states distributed over the different bit weights. And this gives a measure of the diffusion power of the mixing layer without regard for the S-box layer. And a good bitweight histogram starts far to the right, and it is quite flat, in the sense that if you were to think of these, these histograms as continuous lines, you would like the slope to be quite small. And then we actually recover the bitweight branch number as the starting value of this histogram here, or the non-zero starting value. So for example, here, Saturnin starts at five, so its bitweight branch number is five. And then we have the boxweight histogram, which uh, shows the number of states distributed over the box weight. And again, we want these histograms to be flat and start far to the right. And the smallest value, so the starting value, is the, the box weight branch number. So for example, for example, Rheindahl has a box weight branch number of 5. So clearly we see that in moving from the bit weight to the box weight, um, the graphs are kind of shifted upwards. So there is a loss of diffusion in going from the bit weight to the box weight, and this phenomenon is that, well, so we call this phenomenon huddling. And in general, huddling increases with the S-box size. However, we found that it's more pronounced in the line size. By the way, the box weight is also a very nice way of um, predicting what happens in the case of two round differential trails, the trail weights to be more specific. And in this slide, we see the differential trail weight histogram versus the differential weight histogram. So on the left, we have the number of trails versus the, the trail weight. And on the right, we have the number of differentials versus the differential weight. And again, we see that in moving from the trail weight histogram to the differential weight histogram, that these histograms are slightly shifted upwards. And this is the result of the fact that within a differential there can be clustering, so multiple trails that have the same input and output difference, and they all contribute to the differential weight. 
So clearly, um, the further a, a histogram is shifted upwards, the more it, it say, suffers from clustering. And we found out that this effect is, again, more pronounced in aligned cycles. Of course, we have done more than just this. So as I already mentioned in the beginning, in addition to the differential propagation properties, we have also computed uh, or looked at the linear propagation properties and have computed the two round histograms of the four ciphers in that case. And looking at these histograms, there were two clear winners, say, namely Saturnin and Zulu, so ciphers that performed the best with respect to this metric. And for these two ciphers, we have computed the three round trail histograms just to see how they compare it in that regard. Moreover, we've also looked at whether the um, approximation of the DP of a trail by the product of the DPs of its active S boxes uh, is an equality or not. So, whether this is a good approximation or not. And as I already mentioned, this is related to the independence of. The round differentials. And for three rounds of Zulu, we actually have looked at this independence and found out that for Zulu there is independence of the round differentials. Moreover, based on available information, so that means looking at the existing literature and doing some back of the envelope calculation, we have sketched what happens when considering the weight histograms of four rounds and beyond. And actually what we found out is that given the same computational resources, so not looking at the same number of rounds, because clearly one round implemented on some architecture can be a lot more resource heavy than the round of another cipher implemented on the same architecture. Given the same number of rounds, we have found that Zulu actually performs the best with respect to the differential and the linear propagation property. So this concludes our presentation and we would like to thank you for your attention.